So on this morning that is a bit gray, may we pause for a moment to ask God to join us in our midst and to help share the light. Let us pray. God, here in this place where you have created fresh hope this morning, may we hear your word newly formed on our hearts. Strengthen our faith so that we may more fully grasp the light you reveal in our midst. May the words of my mouth and the response you place in each of our hands bring your presence alive in the world. Amen. So good morning. I do bring you greetings this morning from the McFarland United Church of Christ. And it seems to be quite fitting for me to wander into your midst this morning on which we are going to be called to think about and to struggle with God's word of place. For to some of you, I am not a stranger in a strange land. No, there are a few of you here today that I know I am more like the prodigal daughter who has come home after a long absence. But that's enough of my own story this morning because what flashed before us this today are the vivid images that jump out at us from the scripture readings. For example, take King Ahab. Here is a guy who's got it all. He is a king, after all. And he has this wife who grew up in a royal family. And their arranged marriage has given him that extra protection that he needs to main control, maintain control in his own country and to bring in a little more wealth along with it. Yes, he has it all. Ahab has set the city of Samaria as his capital, and there he has built his palace. However, on this morning, we learn about events that occur as Ahab and Jezebel travel to their second home in Jezreel. While the events that unfold before us in 1 Kings probably occurred in the mid-900s BC, the Jezreel Valley today continues to be a very rich and fertile land that produces wheat and cotton and corn for the country of Israel. Yet this powerful man who seemingly has it all, what does he do when things don't go his way? Well, he stomps out of the room, pouts like a child, goes to his bedroom, and bam, slams the door. For us, Ahab's proposals to Naboth, the idea of sell, selling land for profit, makes a lot of sense in our world of capitalism today. Buy low, sell high, and reap the profits. But for Jezebel, when she hears about Ahab's whining, this proposal to Naboth makes no sense at all. She, after all, has always lived in a world of monarchs. Her parents were royalty. She was a princess of Phoenicia. Her marriage was arranged with Ahab to strengthen political ties. This woman, Jezebel, has grown up in a palace where the kings and the lords were probably scheming all the time how to gain more land and wealth. That's just the way life was. In this green land of Wisconsin, with all of our modern conveniences, it is difficult for us to imagine the feeling of promise that gods of fertility would bring to the people of Israel living in an area surrounded by desert, frequently plagued by risks of starvation and famine, brought on by drought. Yet this is the culture in which Jezebel was raised. 
She grew up in the culture of the Canaanites, who worshipped the gods of fertility, Baal and Asherah. Life in the land of Israel nearly 3,000 years ago included confrontations between people who worshipped these gods and the Israelites who had settled in this land after their escape from Egypt. These Israelites, these aliens in a foreign land, followed this concept of a single god, Yahweh. Jezebel had likely heard a bit about this god, Yahweh, and Yahweh's law, laws as she and her family had dealt with the people of Israel. As had Ahab, who, according to the biblical accounts today, was a young adult during times of turmoil in this land and much political upheaval. Amidst changing powers and changing political borders, Ahab likely heard a mix of stories surrounding not only Yahweh, but also Baal and Asherah. It was in this place that Ahab was forced to confront a new answer when he bartered with Naboth for the vineyard that Ahab so badly wanted to add to his own kingdom. Now, we might not want to hear it either, for Naboth's response comes from the book of Leviticus. Now, remember, Leviticus is this book in the Hebrew Bible that is filled with lists of dietary codes and laws concerning worship, and specifically the worship of multiple gods, and also God's continued call to us to care for the earth and for our neighbors. In today's world, Leviticus can also make us cringe if we don't look at the time and the place in which these laws were developed. It was there, in that place, that Ahab was immersed in a world of power and consumption and was deeply shaken by the word of God that Naboth had given to him. As Naboth reveals in Ahab's presence the words that Moses had acquired from God. The land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is God's. And with God, you are but alien and tenants. Okay, so now you may not have recently read the book of Leviticus, but it is there that Naboth takes his stand and remains firm in his faith even if that faith means angering a somewhat powerful king. Now, as I took the time to wonder who was most distraught following this confrontation, Naboth, who must have worried about what was going to become of him and his family after turning down the king's offer, or King Ahab himself, However, it's just King Ahab's stories that we have today. We know that there, in Naboth's faith, Ahab was greatly disturbed. He heard God's word revealed, but he didn't want to confront this concept of God's immensity versus human desires. 